Let's go. Hello everyone, and thanks for joining us for this panel about the next wave of affiliate marketing and the challenge in affiliate marketing for 2024. So I let our speaker and guest present themselves. So Attila, you want to start? Hey everybody, my name is Attila. I've been an affiliate marketer since uh, 2008 and uh, an STM member since 2013. And uh, basically I always do whatever is trendy right now. Currently that being lead gen, paper call, and also uh, search arbitrage. Umar? Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Umar, founder of Digitas Finance. Uh, yeah, I can see this stuff. So, yeah, so have some we, fun. we are a global uh, text consultant, uh, exclusively serving digital entrepreneurs like affiliates, e com marketers, you know, influencers, and we help them optimize their personal as well as, you know, the business taxes. Matej? Hello. So, my name is Matej. Uh, hello. <laughs> so, even though it's hard to believe, I'm in affiliate marketing even 10 years longer than Attila. And on the forum since 2015, I think. And he actually introduced me to that place. So thank you for that. Uh, during the years, I think I've done everything there was to try in affiliate marketing. And currently, I have quite a few activities on my schedule. So I help people on the STM, now Affiliate World Forum. I'm also involved with organizing this conference for you. So thanks for attending. And yeah, I still, write, I still run campaigns on the side to keep my finger of the, on the pulse of the industry, mainly in the lead generation verticals, working with all kinds of traffic pretty much. Yep. OK, thank you. And I'm Jeremy, and I'm based in Chile. And I run a lead generation agency for immigration lawyers, so very niche. And I'm also a moderator on the STM forum, Affiliate World Forum, in charge of all the tech issue. I'm helping our member with that. So guys, so for those of know, you who don't know, all these events start like more than 10 years ago with the STM forum, which is not affi now Affiliate World Forum. And our members here are members of the forum also. So guys, can you tell us a bit how the forum helped you grow during all your year in affiliate marketing? So Attila, you want to start? Yeah, so I started, like when I got into affiliate marketing, I started with dating and then after that I switched into Nutra and the forum was like very useful for me because uh, there's a lot of things that you need to learn and really quickly uh, figure out and the incredible community on the forum truly helped with that. I would share case studies, get you know feedback and right away be able to um, how do you say, like, uh, solve the problem. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Uma? Yeah, so um, I joined the forum in 2018, you know, and um, it was really good to sort of like interact with this affiliate community, uh, you know, find out what are the challenges they are facing, especially, you know, in terms of like taxes. Uh, you know, in terms of corporate setups, accounting, you know, so these sort of things. And, you know, then just working backwards and, you know, just work out a solution for them and just offer them up. So it was a really good, you know, interaction for that. Okay, for me, uh, at the time when I became a member, based on the recommendation from Attila, I was going through a change. Bef before 2015, I was building websites and monetizing them. But then Google started to introduce their pandas and penguins and basically killed my business. So I decided to go with paid traffic instead. And Attila told me about, told me like, hey, there's this place called STM and they, this is what they talk about. So I joined and I realized how many stupid mistakes I was making up until that point. So even though it was a paid subscription, it actually saved me money in the long run because I could just look at the mistakes that the others have made and I learned from them. And that basically started my career with paid traffic, and I never looked back, basically. OK, thanks, guys. So now let's start on the core of the, of the panel, the challenge for 2024. So Attila first and Matej, what are the challenges you are currently focusing on when you're running your campaign, your business on affiliate marketing? OK, so affiliate marketing is always changing. So one of the biggest challenges that I face is uh, 
You know, like one day we're doing good in one vertical and we wake up and there's a new policy tomorrow and then we have to basically start from zero and figure out what's next. So this is where having a network and knowing a lot of people in the industry is very helpful because then you can you know, hit them up and be like, hey, what's going good right now? You know, what should I do? Like, for example, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, currently in Paper Call, Affordable Care Act, ACA, was absolutely huge. But now it has come to an end. You know, it's like people are saying that it's done. And uh, they're looking for the next best thing. And the next best thing is looking to be debt, for example, debt calls. And uh, yeah, I know this because, you know, I'm very much involved with networking and knowing people. So if you are quick to adapt, to change, then you can continue to make a lot of money with affiliate marketing. OK, thank you, Attila. Matej, you want so to? So challenge is, how should I put it? Um, I mean, affiliate marketing itself is a challenge. So if you want to survive in it for the long run, you have to have certain type of a mindset. So you need to stay on top of things, of the changes. So when I look back over the years, so. I started with building websites. That was making great money up until a certain point, and then it ended. So then I started to promote offers. So I started with app installs, which was running great. Then it ended because of the regulations. And I could go on, on and on. So the main thing you need in order to survive in this industry and to overcome the challenges of actually surviving is you need to keep yourself informed, educated. You need to build your network, right? That's why we are here obviously. And I think if you nail these things down, then you're set for a long-lasting career, I would say. So keep the hustler's mindset, keep moving, and don't give up, because it wasn't easy for any of us. But those who kind of give it the time it needs can make great money, can have great careers, enjoy the freedom that this industry can provide. And I cannot really think of any other industry that would, what, with relatively low investment, to provide such an opportunity and the freedom to travel, work from wherever you want. So that's why I'm still around. I kind of I love it. If okay. you give it what it what it requires, it's it's just great. Okay, so one of the questions we often have on the forum is like I can't get profitable on my campaign, the cost of uh, the advertising is too high. So guys, uh, how do you manage to get your campaign profitable with, in the context of rising costs in terms of paid advertising? OK, so this is a very good question, because a lot of the people that come into affiliate marketing, they think that, you know, I'm just going to do a $100 test, and I'm going to make a million dollars. And it doesn't work like that. Like, I, I can tell you that our winning campaigns are created. Like, it's a process. So to combat the rising costs of advertising and to make sure that there is like a margin for you, basically the profit, you do have to test a lot of creatives, you know. It's not enough to test one, two, three. You probably have to test 50 to 100, for example, in the case of uh, like lead generation. And uh, you will find that some ads, for who knows what reason, are going to absolutely pop. Like, it's incredible. And I've been doing this for a long time, and I don't understand why. But sometimes an ad will just pop. You know, it will, you'll think that it's, what the hell? How can this, you know, those do so good? But then the data doesn't lie, right? And there's profit. And like, whoa, OK, I got to scale this. I need to take this ad formula and make ads like it. And that's how you basically deal with rising costs. <clears throat> yeah, Attila made some great points. I would like to add some more. So uh, we often don't realize how much money we waste. So what I'm doing every now and then is I'm going all over the tools I'm using and getting rid of those that I don't. And surprisingly, oftentimes it can, it can be a lot. There are other things you can use, like when you're charging the accounts with the traffic sources. You can use credit cards and get some cash back. You can use. I don't know, wire transfers, where it makes sense to save on the transfer cost. But yeah, in the end, uh, it all comes down to how effective you actually can manage your media buying campaigns. So the only way to combat rising costs is to become more effective and improve your conversion rate. 
your lead quality so you can actually negotiate better payouts with your partners and that's pretty much about it. I mean, like so that's a good point actually. That was my next question about improving okay. payouts. We, we just talked about how to optimize the cost by, by improving your creatives and, and improving your, your buying, buying media strategy. But what about improving payouts? How do you negotiate with your buyer on your networks? Okay, that's another great question. And um, newbie affiliates always believe that a high payout is going to be like more profit. No, like if I'm a network owner and you say, oh, I don't know who's giving me f some, like network A is giving me $50 payout, I'll give you $60 payout. I can go behind the scenes and adjust the numbers so that I actually give you a $50 payout as well, but you will think it's a $60 payout. So what you want to make sure is you want to see what your earnings per click are, like the EPCs. What is the EPC when you send 100 clicks, 1,000 clicks? That's what matters, not the payout. Like if an offer converts at 100%, it can pay you $20 instead of 50, and you're going to make more money. So look at the RPC, like get the network report, give me RPC report for the top 10 offers for the past seven days, and then base your decision on which offers you're going to test that way. Yeah, great points. And to add something to this dis discussion, so we have to keep in mind one thing. We are all in the business to make money, and it's not just us, the affiliates. It's also the companies that we are actually sending the leads to. So we need to make sure they are actually able to monetize on the back end. So in order to get the better payouts, you need to make sure you are promoting that uh, you are promoting something that the advertiser is actually offering. So if you lie on your landing pages, if you try to be clickbaity with your ads, obviously you can get the traffic cheaper, but it's not going to back, back out for the advertiser. And there is no way for them to pay you higher when they cannot make money on the back end. So this is a big thing. Another tip I could share, so we are probably the majority of you in the audience are media buyers, so you can target any country in the world. So if you are buying traffic, let's say from Germany, make sure you are actually buying people who have set their browser language or system language to German. So this is one tip I got from someone long time ago. It can have such a dramatic impact on the lead quality. It is, it's kind of insane. It was, it was insane to me when I first tried it. I don't know, uh, targeting, right? So selecting the, the audience you actually want to show your ads to can have a massive impact on the, on the lead quality in the end. And okay. yeah, if, Thank you. Uh, to follow up on that, on that question, what about running direct? I, I see also some question about running direct on the forum. Uh, people are saying, yeah, but if I go direct, I save the affiliate network commission. So what's your view on that, guys? OK. Um, this running direct, the idea is good, but if you are like a noob affiliate, the advertisers don't want to work with you. They usually want to work with people that are proven already. You have an easier chance of just registering at three different networks, taking that offer and split testing, A, B, C, testing the offer to see again which one does the highest EPC and they're running it to that. And later, after you have proven yourself, then you can actually figure out who the advertiser is. Usually, if you look at the terms and conditions and the privacy policy on the offer page, you can get this info, and then you can find them on LinkedIn and reach out to them with a line like, hey, I've been doing 100 you know, conversions per day on your offer. Would it be possible to work direct with you? And that's when you take that leap and you go to the next level. But if you're starting out and you're relatively new, you're not really doing volume, it's pointless, you know, because you just open yourself up to basically potential risk of not being paid and also about not, you know, of being ignored because a lot of guys will not work with someone who didn't prove themselves. So Yeah. So I get asked this question a lot, both on the forum and in person. And yeah. My answer is yes and no, like depends on, on your situation. So like Attila mentioned, it's definitely not, not for the new guys because and it's not just because the advertisers don't want to work with you yet. It's also for your own good because if you go with the network, 
they have many of them have hundreds, if not thousands, of offers. So if one of them doesn't work out for you, you can just try another one. And the network will give you the benefit of the doubt, and they, they will let you test several offers before they kick you out. If you go with a direct advertiser and your leads just don't back out for them, that's game over, right? Because they, maybe they have one product, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they have 20, but they certainly don't have thousands of them. So when you're starting out, definitely go with the network. It's also the layer of protection that Attila mentioned. Uh, the risk of not getting paid is lower, I would say. Then again, right, if, if you have your campaigns in line, the funnels optimized, they, they will let you test several offers before they kick you out. If you go with a direct advertiser and your leads just don't back out for them, that's game over, right? Because they, maybe they have one product, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they have 20, but they certainly don't have thousands of them. So when you're starting out, definitely go with the network. It's also the layer of protection that Attila mentioned. Uh, the risk of not getting paid is lower. I would say. Then again, right, if, if you have your campaigns in line, the funnels optimized, and you can actually deliver quality leads, then by all means go direct, because you're basically cutting out the middleman who just has to take their share, right? So you can have the full payout. And if you find the right people to work with, I mean, to those direct advertisers, you can actually optimize the funnels better, because they can give you all the information you need. So. These ads work for us. I mean, this angle work for us. And the network can give you this information too, but not to the level of deepness as a direct advertiser can do. So yeah, do it when the time is right. OK, thank you, guys. So we've just discussed how to optimize your gross profit, basically. Uh, but I'd like to hear, Humano, on how you can elaborate on strategy to improve your take-home revenue after taxes. So that's your specialty. So what yeah. can you share with us today? Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of this um, depends on your corporate setup, you know, so like where exactly, you know, you have kind of set up the company. So I think it's, it's quite important that you choose the right jurisdiction and, you know, you set up in the right manner from the start. So, you know, you can enjoy those, uh, you know, those, uh, those tax, like especially, you know, these low tax jurisdictions where you can incorporate the companies. But, you know, at the same time, you need to set up in a way that, you know, you're not sort of like, overriding any tax laws or anything. For example, uh, you know, Dubai is a very classic example of that because um, it's not just like a paper company, so it's a company, you know, with come with a lot of like substance attached to it as well. So mostly like the shareholders and the directors, you know, would kind of get like um, a UA resident permit, you know. So there is kind of an economic connection attached to the to the company as well. So, you know, uh, so as long as you can you can register in one of these like low tax jurisdiction, you know, in the right manner. You can actually increase your take home profits by quite a bit. Okay, thank you, Omar. So we've just discussed uh, about quality. Both of you guys mentioned uh, the importance of quality to maintain a good relation with the buyer. Uh, we see that the increasing ad cost, it also means for the traffic source increasing ad revenue for publishers. And some publishers are more lenient on both and fraudulent traffic. So how do you guys manage uh, the fraud to maintain a good quality at the offer level, the traffic you send to the offer? We say well, lately, like it, ha it wasn't like this years ago, but lately, I don't know why, there's a lot of uh, like complaints always about fraud, spam rates, stuff like that from advertisers and from offer owners. And we actually noticed that uh, it's different from country to country. So we maintain, uh, like we manage basically fraud levels by maintaining an open communication with the traffic source. I mean, not the traffic source, the offer owner basically who's buying the lead and asking them, you know, like how's the lead quality, stuff like that. Is every state in the United States okay? And they will tell us like cut Oregon or exclude, you know, like uh, Wyoming or we don't like New York, stuff like that. And by having this, you know, this open form of communication, you can really optimize your uh, traffic without having to invest in all of these tools that are created to actually manage fraud. Because those tools can cost so much money that it's way easier just to, you know, just to send a message to your AM and ask them to, hey, like, can you check with the advertiser if they have any bad, you know, feedback about spam rate, whatever. And then you just exclude that when you're doing the media buy. Yeah, but so 
there was one famous speech every one of you knows, and it starts with, I have a dream, right? So I have a dream about a world with traffic sources without bad traffic. <laughs> Not going to happen anytime soon, I guess. So unfortunately, even if they tried, they cannot like, eliminate this completely. It's just not possible. So we just have to live with that. So to me, like, there are many people who think, like we see it on the forum all the time. So the new people, they share the statistics from their campaign, and they see, like, I am almost profitable, but I have 20% of bad traffic. So if I didn't have that, I would be profitable, well, which is the wrong way to look at it, because it's always going to be there. So you just have to kind of count with it, and that, that's just the part of the, of the traffic which you are buying. So the way I'm looking at it, to me, it's not like it's some extremely important issue. It's more of an annoyance. So I try to filter out what I can. What I can, it just stays in the mix. So the, I mean, the only real problem it poses to me personally is that bad traffic messes up the optimization process. Because what might happen is, so let's say you are split testing two offers, and you just do a 50-50 split. So what can happen is, because there are bots in the mix, one of the offers might get like a higher share of that bot traffic. In the end, that means that you might actually cut the better offer. But again, it, it's impossible to get rid of that completely. So you just have to keep this in mind, like always. So if you are making some final calls on an offer or on a campaign, just give it a few more minutes. Take a look at the traffic breakdown. Try to analyze what's the percentage of the bot traffic, and if it's really the offer that's bad, or it's the traffic mix, okay. and the bots just making the campaigns unprofitable. So yeah, it's an annoyance we unfortunately have to deal with, and we'll have to deal with in the future as well. OK, guys. My next question for Umar. So affiliate marketers are sometimes tend to run some angle which may be not that compliant with the, police, the policies, and that can generate risk for them. So how can they protect themselves of any potential liabilities? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I think um, I will go back to the same point again, you know, which is the economic substance, you know. So nowadays, you know, especially how the, the tax laws, you know, have like shaped up worldwide. So you can't just have like, a, let's say, for example, you know, if you're living in Europe, you know, you just have like a paper company, say, in BVI or Seychelles, you know, or Cayman, and you just end up paying zero taxes, you know. That doesn't really work these days because you need to have some sort of a connection, you know, attached to the company you know, attached to the jurisdiction of where the company is actually incorporated. So that's, you know, like a, like a very big kind of a legal challenge, you know. So you need to kind of make sure, you know, wherever you are incorporating your companies, you know, it has some sort of like a substance attached to either the directors, you know, um, or, the, or the shareholders of the company, you know, so you can legally protect it, you know, from, um, you know, from, from falling into, into like a tax evasion net. So, yeah. Okay, so two days ago we had the first timer meetup, like uh, two days ago, and we had almost 250 people joining first time the affiliate world uh, conference. So, what Attila Matesh, what advice could you give you to this new affiliate marketer? What should they do when starting in 2024? Okay, so this is the age-old question, right, on how to start affiliate marketing, and one of the um, the most beneficial advice or tips I can share is not to be scared of taking risk because affiliate marketing is all about taking risk. Like you will lose money, but you have to think of this as investing into your education and also into buying data because you know you will meet a lot of people here who will tell you that I make 100,000, 1 million, whatever. Most of the time it's fluff because it's not that easy and only very few make that much. But the data does not lie. So when the data says it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But when the data says you're profitable, then you're profitable. So you have to basically just copy what is working remake that ad and scale up and there you go. You can have your first $1,000 campaign that way. So don't be scared to take risks. Yeah, I would say um, don't give up. I mean, I've been hearing this over and over over the years. So 
people are just saying like affiliate marketing is over, it's dead. And still every time we have affiliate world, there is more and more people. So I mean, it doesn't seem like a dying industry to me, right? <laughs> so it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy. It was easier 20 years ago when I started, but there is no way going back, right? So it's not easy, but it's doable. And I mean, just don't, don't give up. I mean, look at any industry. Any industry that has the potential to generate like high returns, it's going to be tough anyways, right? And I mean, just let's, let's take an example. Like, look at the car producing industry. If 10 years ago you would tell someone that there can be a guy who just builds a car brand and dominates the world, they would just laugh into your face like, now look at Tesla. So they did it. And it can be done in any industry. You just need the right mindset and you just, just don't give up. And maybe one more advice. So when you are starting out, keep in mind that you don't have to start with something where you actually find your success. So we have this question a lot on, on the forum. So people are asking about like what traffic source or traffic type should I start with? So there are some that are more suitable for the newbies, newbies than the others. So I don't know, if you've never run paid traffic before, there is push and pop traffic. It's probably not going to make you a millionaire, but there is no other traffic source as cheap as push or pops. So if you just want to test the waters, feel what it is like to run real traffic, to feel what it, feel, uh, what it is like to get your first conversion, just go with that traffic type. Once you learn, once you understand the process, once you understand tracking, optimization, lead quality, and all there is to understand, well, then venture out and find something that you maybe even feel passionate about or what you understand, what you have a lot of information on, and go there. But you don't have, you don't have to start with that straight away. Like, don't make it harder on you than you actually have. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, one last question, very quickly, 30 seconds each. One last tip or comment you want to share with the audience before we wrap up. Attila? 30 seconds, please. Just brief. OK. Um, if somebody tells you to go left, go right. OK. When I was new, they told me, dude, you should run mobile. It was WhatsApp pin submits. And if you tried running it on desktop, you could do 500% ROI. So if everybody's telling you to go one direction, be like, OK, you know what? I'll try the other direction. <laughs> and you're going to see potential. Good luck. So. Thank you. Uma? Yeah, so, you know, um, I would just say that um, you should pick the, you know, when you're about to start the business, you know, so make sure you pick the right jurisdiction, you know, and you set up the company, you know, in a manner so, like, when you're scaling it up, you know, you're not exposed to, you know, any, any, any legal implications or, or, you know, like any, any, any text implications. Um, like, I'll, I'll give an example because these text laws and everything, you know, they just keep sort of changing up quite a bit. So, Dubai is a classic example where it used to be like a zero text, you know, uh, up until last year, but it's no longer a jurisdiction with zero text. So, I think it's, qu I, it's quite important that, you know, you sort of like keep up to date, you know, with how the text are, texts are going on. And there are still ways, you know, you can still restructure, modify your stuff in your, you know, even in your Dubai setup and still continue, you know, enjoying the zero texts. Matesh, very quickly, if you want to add that's something. A, that's a tough one. Oh, I'll wrap up, up to you. Okay, choose who you take advice from. I mean, you don't go to someone who lives in a tent asking for investment advice, right? So these days you can verify pretty much anything online. So if someone says he's active in something, then just verify it and then <laughs> consider whether the advice actually does make sense or not. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks everyone. No QNF for this panel, but if you have questions.